There's something about that name. I, I think it's prophetic that you just keep doing that. Go, go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 14. Mark chapter 16, verse number 14. So Jesus has died Friday. He's gotten up on Sunday. Now we have about 50 days until we reach Pentecost. Pentecost is when the New Testament church comes together, and, and we'll, we'll talk about it as, as the days come. But how, I, I want you to know that Jesus didn't just go silent for 50 days. That, that after he got up, he actually uh, had about 49 days worth of work that he instituted. Because God never gets you up for the sake of getting up. That there's always some purpose for getting up. Amen? Amen? Go to Mark 16. The Bible says in verse 14, after he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat and ate and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe what he said as it relates to being risen. Can you believe that those guys were with him all that time and saw all of those miracles? By the way, you must understand that all of the miracles of Jesus were not recorded in the scripture. So there were some blind people that he healed that never got recorded. There were some lame legs that he fixed that never got recorded. They saw possibly hundreds of miracles. They saw Peter walk on water they saw him change water to wine, and they didn't believe that he would get up. See, people will believe what you do for them. They will not believe what you are. I want you to, don't, don't even, if, if you don't hear what I just said, so if I told you I'm going to pay your bills, you will believe it. Because you're the benefactor of my act. But to have to believe me and not know the perceived benefits. See, there are people, they believe in what you can do for them. They just don't believe you are who you are. And what they don't understand is, is the power ain't in what you can do. The power is in who you are. See, some, how many of y'all got a job? See, the power ain't in the check. The power's in you. If you left that job and went to another job, you can get paid somewhere else. The power ain't in that piece of paper. The power's in the fact that God gave you enough strength to get up to go to work. Is, is this, does this make sense? So they didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, why would you send unbelievers to give a message of belief? You don't know how to use your enemies. You, you, don't, you don't know how to use it. The only people you want to deal with are the ones who believe. He didn't send believers out. He sent non-believers out. You miss your blessing when you say stuff like this. I just can't deal with them. See, you're missing it. The ones you can't deal with are the ones God is going to use. Jesus went to them and said, man, how long I got to deal with y'all? Well, you, they went to sleep. When he told them to pray, he said, how long I got to deal with y'all? Y'all can't even pray for an hour. Those are the ones he sent. <laughs> I think this is going to be a hard one, I can tell right now. So he says, he tells people, look, I'm getting on you for not believing. Now get up and go make others believe. Because there is no person who can help them believe in you more than the one who used to not believe in you. God is about to convert some people in your life. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these are the signs that shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Did you know that you are standing next to somebody, if they use their power, they could heal you right now? This is what you need to do. You need to look at the person beside you and say, you better hurry up and start believing, because...
like literally you are next to somebody that if they access their power they can say i command all of your financial disability but they won't believe so touch your name say you better get your belief up and go move get your belief up and go move. so then after the lord had spoken unto them he was received up to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Now that right hand is something else. The Bible says that his right hands, there are pleasures forevermore. Right hand talks about the authority of God. See, God's about to put you in a position of authority. All of your life, people have had authority over you. People have always been your boss. People have always been your supervisors. People, have, God says he's about to shift that season and he's about to put you in a position of authority. Touch three people and say, get ready to be in charge. And they went forth. I feel like the Holy Ghost is going to be. And, and they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirmed the words with the signs following. So he confirms their work with miracles, which means that God actually backed them. He backed them. They said it and God did it. All God is waiting on you to do is open your mouth and declare it. And if you just start believing, God's just going to start backing your message. <laughs> I want to talk on this subject for the next few moments. I want to talk about after the thrill is gone. Just talk about after the thrill is gone. Touch, touch three people on your way down and say, after the thrill is gone. After the thrill is gone. Man, I grew up in a house with a mama who let us listen to old school music. I think ain't nothing more of a blessing to be raised by somebody who listened to old school music. I'm telling you, we, we, would, we would have to, we had to clean up on Saturday before we went outside. Wasn't no going outside on the weekend without making sure that bathroom was clean, them, them dishes were washed, we had to clean up and, and we had we didn't have no vacuum when, when, when we first started out. We had to sweep the carpet. How many of y'all remember sweeping the carpet? Well, my mother would put in Al Green and Marvin Gaye, and I've been loving that music ever since. I still listen to it now. My sisters and my wife and them know when they get in the car with me, I don't listen to nothing new. I get in there, I find out all the new stuff when I'm in the car with them. When they're in the car with me, I'm listening to the same old, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, my, my latest and greatest inspiration. I'm listening. I'm, that's what I do. That's what I, that's what I listen to. And, I, and, and this Luther Vandross, I just, it's, but man, let me tell you, it's this dude named B.B. King. He had a guitar. Her name was Lucille. Y'all remember Lucille? And he had this song called The Thrill Is Gone. Now, because I'm saved, I won't get into all of the minutiae uh, uh, surrounding the terminology uh, and the collection of melodies that he put together and called it a song. But what I will tell you is that the description is, is that there are some things in life uh, that you treat better when you're excited, uh, that you have a tendency to lose respect for power after the thrill is gone. You see, you see if you get married for a thrill, uh, you won't want the marriage for long because sometimes the thrill is gone. Uh, I, I, remember, I remember when, when, when my wife said to me one day, she said, we ought to buy Caitlin a dog for her birthday. That was a good idea. Dog was cute. He came in the house and lit everybody on fire. Oh, he was cute. Then they find out that he go to the bathroom. And they, now they want to get rid of him because the thrill... Oh, y'all ain't saying amen in here. The thrill is gone. Some, some of y'all, you got to that car dealership and you got that car and it was good because they told you you could get it and the first two months was going to be free. And, and you thought, yeah, that's good because I'll be able to save up enough money in the next two months to put up and I'll always be ahead on the notes, but life didn't work out that way, did it? 
And when that cardinal came after 45, 60 days, you thought, Lord Jesus, I need to get this thing back because the thrill is gone. Because things are exciting in the beginning. But once life shows you that, that everything is not an amusement park, that, 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 that there is no cotton candy in life, that there is no hot dogs, you don't get sweet pickles and put peppermints in them, you don't, that, that, that life, life is an amalgam of troubles. In fact, the Bible lets us know that a, more, a man born of a woman is of a few days, and guess what? You only got a few of them, and they're full of trouble. Jesus has been with these disciples, and they got an opportunity to walk with him. They have seen him change water to wine. Thrill. Lame people get up. Thrill. Eyes opened. Thrill. Goes into the temple and turns over the money tables. Look at our Jesus. Sticking to the plan. He's a great God. Look at him. Going from house to house, blessing and, and, and preaching at the synagogues. And look at, look at the thrill of breaking a few pieces of bread and fish and, and feeding a multitude. Look at the thrill. And now he's no longer performing the miracles and now tells them that the miracle worker responsibility is now theirs. Now the thrill is gone because Jesus didn't just perform miracles for the sake of performing miracles. Look at what he has to do in order to perform the miracles. See, his, his miracle working ministry was offset by going into the wilderness and fasting and praying for 40 days. That he's able to perform miracles, but not without being hungry for over a month. He's able to perform miracles, but not without being left and, and, and the foxes of the ground having holes and the birds of the air having nests, but the Son of Man having nowhere to lay his head. Look at the difficulty that's associated with the life that can perform a miracle. So the disciples saw Jesus performing the miracles, and they were excited that they were connected to a guy who could perform miracles. But once he turned the miracle working ministry over to them, and they now have to fast. And now they have to go into the Garden of Gethsemane for 40 days and be tempted of the devil. See, see, it's, it's never as easy as you think. It's never as easy as you think. Whenever you see somebody doing something great and you sit back and say, oh, I can do that, you may think you can do that, but are you willing to go into the wilderness and fast for 40 days? Are you willing to, to, to let somebody smack your cheek and turn the other cheek? Are you willing to let those speak all manner of evil against you? Are you willing to go to your cross and let them crucify you and then say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Most of us see the miracle, but we miss the man. We miss the means by which the man became a miracle wonder that God was a faster. He was a prayer. He would go by himself and get away from everybody. He would go up to the mountain of transfiguration and leave everybody behind. Look at, look at how different he is. And so now you've got all of these people, these, these disciples who, who, who have seen Jesus do all of this stuff. And now the thrill has gone back away. And they are left here to do the miracles themselves. And Jesus has been disappointed with them before. Because remember, there was a boy who was, who was involved in self-destructive behavior. The Bible says that, that he was foaming at the mouth and he was doing all kinds of stuff. And the disciples, instead of healing him, you know what they did? They went back and said, Jesus, this boy over here is acting crazy and throwing himself into the fire and, and, and is, is foaming at the mouth. Can you do something with him? Jesus said, why are you talking to me? I'm paraphrasing, but he says, why are you talking to me? I gave you the power to perform miracles. Do you know that some of you pray about stuff and the reason why nothing happens is because God ain't going to answer a prayer that he gave you power for? Did you know that? That you're on your knees saying, God, I need you. I need you to help me with my finances. And God says, you don't need help with your finances. You need to budget. I'll, let, I'll wait until you... F I'll, I'll wait until you stop shopping and start tithing, and then I'll get involved. Oh, yeah, y'all ain't going to say amen. Go and look at your neighbor and start saying, it's one of them, yeah. They're, they're, the reason why some of your miracles are taking so long is you're praying over things that God is not answering. You, you know, everything don't need to be prayed for. I hate to tell you that, and I know that just sounds anticlimactic, and, and, and I know you're saved and you want to pray about it, but every, you don't got to pray about everything. 
Lord, Lord, give me the ability to, to, to stand up. No, just stand. <laughs> Lord, what do you want me to wear tomorrow? I don't know and I don't care. Do you know there's some people who actually pray about getting dressed? Lord, what do you want me to wear so that I can get the job? Uh, boo. No, it's called preparation. That's what's going to get you the job. It's called knowing what you're talking about. You're not going to pray up on no outfit and God going to tell you to pick the knee-length skirt and the shoulder-length shirt. and That, that ain't going to get you. You ain't got to pray about that. Just go in there and do what you got to do. A lot of people pray about things and they ask God to do things that he has already given them the power to do. And that's exactly what happens in this text. Now, what is amazing about this text is that the Bible continues to prove itself to be inerrant. In other words, the Bible has no errors. There is not one error in the Bible, not the original language. Now, now these books that they sell us in the store, they have errors in them. But I'm talking about the original scriptures that were downloaded into the prophets, the priests, and the epistles, and the major and minor prophets. There are no errors in it. The Bible says that not one jot nor tittle that not, not one of the smallest letters in the alphabet of the Greek and Hebrew will be a misnomer or a mistake in the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God is perfect. Those who apply it are not. But the Word of God is inerrant. It's amazing then when you read Mark chapter 16 that it actually mirrors Philippians chapter 2. Now that's amazing. Because Paul and Mark didn't even know each other. They were not even born in the same time. And so now you have Mark writing something that Paul will later come and write, and it will mirror each other. If you look at it, in Mark chapter 1 through 13, the Bible talks about how Jesus is a servant. And when you look at Philippians chapter 1 and 2, the Bible says that he's a servant. And that he came and he humbled himself to the point of death. That's what the Bible says. And then the Bible says that he humbled himself even to the point of the cross. And then Philippians 2 and 9 talks about his exaltation. And then it seems as if Mark turns around and says again in our text that he has been exalted. And as the choir was singing, that he has a name above every other name. And then, then Philippians goes and talks about how God calls us to the world. And then God lets us know that he also calls us to the world. And look at, look at the, the synchronicity of Matthew and Mark and Philippians, writers who never knew each other, who write about the same thing. That's why when you come to the church sometime and I preach a word and you say, man, how does the pastor know my business? Or, or married couples will be arguing with each other and I'll say something and y'all accuse each other. Oh, you must have been talking to the pastor about what we're going through. He, he or she hasn't talked to me about anything. It's, it's that you don't know the power of religion and you don't know the power of church and you don't know the power of relationship and you don't know the power of coming to church. You don't understand that the reason why you come here is because God is going to tell me in private what you have been dealing with in public. And what he does is he establishes himself in the sermon to show you that the pastor doesn't need to be in your business. That if he listens to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will download into my mouth what needs to be said so that it will be downloaded in your spirit. And God is trying to make a connection to let you know that he is revealing himself through the word of God. And as opposed to being skeptical about the synchronicity of what you're going through and what I'm saying, what you ought to be is excited about the fact that God loves you enough to to give you a rhema word, to give you a fresh word that God will speak to you and to your situation on a weekly basis. So instead of being skeptical, you ought to be praiseful. You ought to be thanking God that he won't let you go through anything that he won't tell me about, that he won't download in my spirit. Here I am standing in one place preaching to hundreds of people, and guess what? All of you all are not hearing the same thing, although I'm saying the same thing. Some people will leave here and thought it was a relationship sermon. Somebody will leave here and think it's a faith sermon. Some people will leave here and think it was a salvation sermon. And guess what? It was all of them because God is ambidextrous. He has the ability to say many things through one word. Is there anybody here that, that's glad that you, don't, that you don't serve a monolithic God, that you don't have to come to the water and wait on the angel to trouble the water so you can wait on your turn to get in, that he has healing for the nation and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation? 
situation. And aren't you glad that all of us can be sitting in this place at the same time and you be healed of finances and you be healed of cancer and you be healed of diabetes and you be healed of frustration and you no longer feel rejected and you no longer feel depressed? One word, but he is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but he can heal us all at the same time. Anybody want to give God just about five seconds of praise that he is not such a monolithic God that he doesn't have to heal on Monday and then bless on Tuesday and then give favor on Wednesday. Anybody glad that he can be everywhere at the same time? Anybody glad that you can get a healing over here saying amen and you can get a healing over here down on your knees and that we don't all have to be in the same posture and we don't all have to praise the same and we don't all have to speak in tongues but we all have the power to step on the serpent's head that we all have the power to speak those things that are not as though they were that we all have the power to go to the next level and dimension of our faith is there anybody that's glad that we serve that kind of God when Jesus ascended from the earth it marked the completion of his earthly ministry and the beginning of his heavenly ministry he ends his earthly ministry and passes that on to the disciples says look I've been here 33 years I've been in my earthly ministry for three I've trained y'all for three years. From here on, you got it. From here on, you got it. From here on, you got it. I am no longer, listen, I am not going to try to do my old job and my new job at the same time. I'm about to preach up in here. Because I understand that even as God, I even have seasons that end. My earthly ministry is over. My heavenly ministry is about to begin. He is now going from an earthly healer to now he's becoming our advocate standing at the right hand of the Father. He is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Here is the first thing you got to understand that when God calls you to the next level, you have to be okay with the end of a season. Oh, everybody shouts in church when God begins a new season, but God says, I never begin a thing without ending a thing. And the thing that most of us don't do well is end. Oh, help me in this church, Holy Ghost. Oh, we begin real good. Pastor, I'm about to start a business. I started writing a book. I got in a relationship. I met my Boaz. I got me a boo. We, we begin real good. But how many of y'all know that we begin good, but we don't always end well? I thought he was my soulmate, but you know the devil does wear sheep clothing. We begin well, but we don't end well. And I am telling you that after the thrill is gone, the thrill is gone. You are not, listen, children of God, there is no more manna coming from heaven. He is no longer going to bring water out of a rock. I'm talking to somebody in here today. Baby, if you're going to get some water, you're going to have to go to the well and go get it yourself. If you're going to want some bread, you got to make it. I am here to tell you that the resurrected king has sent me to tell you and give you a word that your manna season is over. Your water springing up out of rocks is over. He is no longer going to spoon feed you. You are now a mature Christian. His earthly ministry is over, and it is time that you stand up and make it happen for yourself because he has given you the power. Some of y'all want to be on spiritual welfare for the rest of your life. And God says, I'm cutting the benefits. I'm cutting the benefits. You make too much to get benefits. Come on and help me in this place. You are no longer welfare worthy. I'm not going to give you any more gospel food stamps. Get your butt up and work because I've given you power. I've given you authority and I have given you anointing. And here is where the rubber meets the road because as long as God is government, you love him. You love the Democratic God. You don't like the Republican God. Oh, y'all ought to help me in here today. You love getting your benefits, but you hate when somebody take them away from you. Don't you understand that when they take the benefits, that is proof that you have made it above a benefit line? That you ought to thank God that you no longer need the benefits. That you ought to thank God that you can do it for yourself. I am talking to some of y'all in here. This is your season to make it happen. This is your year to make it happen. Nobody's coming to save you. Nobody's going to do it for you. Slap somebody and say, I'm going to do it for myself. You have to be okay with the end of a season. And let me tell you something. If you read your Bible carefully, when Joseph became the, the leader over the prison, Understand, he was no longer over Potiphar's house. 
Did you hear what I said? Because in order to start a position, you have to end a position. God is not going to let you continue to be everything you've always been at the same time. So if you're, if you're going to be a manager, you got to stop being an employee. Come on now. If you want to be a wife, stop acting like a spoiled brat. If you want to be a husband, you can't be a player. You got to change. Lord, help me in this church today. You can't be rich and have bad spending habits. You got to end the season before God starts another. And what most of us want God to do, you want God to bless you financially with your own spending habits. You got to end the season to start a season. Lord, help me to say, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. I'm not going anywhere. God is not going to send you good people and you're still evil. You got to end the season before you start a season. If God sends the people in your life right now that you need and you still got that attitude that... You got to end the season. Slap somebody and say, you got to end the season. You got to end how you think. You got to, listen, you got to come out from among them. You got to get away from your evil ways. There are some things you got to end before God starts. God will never allow you to be you and the future you at the same time and bless you with a tomorrow. You've got to put to death one season before God starts another season. And I am telling you and I am putting you on notice that there is a shift in the seasons. Somebody shout, there's a shift in the seasons. There is a shift in the season. Yes, the flower needs the rain, but if the rain doesn't stop, then the flower will be drowned by the same water that made it grow. And when the sun starts to shine, if there is no fall, then the sun will take away what the water gave it. There always has to be seasons. The reason why we have winter is not because God wants us to be cold. It's because viruses thrive in heat and they die in cold. And so God sends the cold to kill what was made in the heat and then he starts it all over again it's called seasons and if you don't go through all of the seasons of your life you are going to be sick the rest of your life because sometimes God makes it cold to kill what tried to kill you when it was warm you got to embrace all of the seasons Paul said I've learned to be a base and a bound I've learned to be content in whatever season it is slap three people say embrace all the seasons you got to embrace your single season because if you don't do single right, you can't do married right. Then you got to embrace your marriage season because if you don't embrace marriage, you're going to be back in your single season. You got to embrace all of your seasons because all of them bring something to the table. We just want summer all life. Little spring too. But God, don't give me no winter. I don't want no winter. I don't, I don't, I'm from Houston. It's cold. I don't like no winter. You know, you know why we all sick around here right now? All this pollen is killing everybody. Because it don't get cold here. Go to Indiana where I came from, ain't nobody sneezing. It's still 30 degrees there. Y'all hear what I'm telling you? You got to embrace all the seasons. If you ever have any season that lasts too long, the same season that made you grow will kill you. April showers do bring May flowers, but if April showers continue in May, it's called a flood. Look at how the definition changes if the season doesn't shift. Do I have anybody who... You understand what I'm telling you? You have to embrace the seasons because the death of one season... It's necessary for the birth of another. He says, my earthly ministry is over, but I'm going to do my heavenly thing now. If the season lasts too long, it'll rob you of what it gave you. If you just make money from now on and you never, ever, ever, ever have another financial problem in your life, you, you, you won't learn how to be a good steward. The check that you get is the level of stewardship you can handle. He gives seed to the sower, not to the storer. <laughs> Does that make sense? He gives seed to the sower, not the storer. See, see, what God gives you is what you can handle. Nothing more, none less. That, that's not rocket science. The end of a season and the beginning of a season is every one of our portion. 
And you're going to be happy sometimes, you're going to be sad sometimes. Sometimes you're going to come in church and you're going to feel like giving God the praise, and sometimes you're going to come in here and you're not going to feel like it. Sometimes you're going to come in here and you just going to be, want to be sad and you want to sit in your feelings. And I understand it because everybody wants to do it. But, but somewhere along the line, you're going to have to shift seasons. You have to shift seasons. Your complaining days are going to have to be over and, and, and your praying days are going to have to begin. <clears throat> like, you, you, you just can't be walking around here depressed forever. So, I mean, can you shift seasons? Come on. I, I know he broke up with you, but so what? I know you raising your kids by yourself, but that lady next to you is too. I know, I know, I know, I know, because we all got our own problems. I know you've been asking God for a new car for the last two years, and he's going to do it. But, but can you get to the season where you start thanking him for what you already have? Man, I wish this was helping somebody. But I'm really, I'm really trying to get you to see that you have to shift seasons perspectives, conversations, it has to shift. Too much complaining is not good. Not enough ain't good either because you need to say something sometimes. But how long are you going to try your methods that have not yielded any fruit? Anybody be honest, with you? you've been trying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Hoping that it worked. That thing ain't yielded. No apples. No dice. Nothing's happening. Nothing more than you're more frustrated with your method. Wondering why it's not working. You got to shift seasons. Manipulation, stop it. It ain't going to work. Trying to trick God into a blessing, you might as well stop it. He's too smart. Running to the altar, just think he's just going to get food because you up here crying. God, like, I will wipe Revelations 24 and 21 and 4. I will wipe every tear away, but I ain't going to do nothing about what's causing them. Everybody say shift seasons. You have to be okay with the end of a season. Some relationships are not going to last forever, and you got to be okay with it. You're going to have, they're going to break up with you. Some of y'all don't mind breaking up with people. You just don't want them breaking up with you. Ain't, ain't that amazing that when the Lord give you a revelation that is supposed to be over, you know, it's holy. But when they give you a revelation that is supposed to be over, uh-uh, who he with? Because can't nobody leave you because you, you the bomb. <laughs> My sister talking about you right about it. Be quiet. <laughs> Season shift. I had to learn that because I used to, when people left the church, I used to be mad. Now I just know season shift. And good. Because too much of them will take what God is trying to give me. Y'all not listening to me today. You ought to be glad some people left you. You ought to be glad some people can't stand you. Now it makes room for the people who really need you. Do you know how much energy you have been pouring into a dead season? I need you to go to your cell phone and find out how many of those minutes was dead minutes. How many dead text messages you gave out? How many data, how many da megabytes of data have you spent on dead Instagram pages looking at dead people who have no life to pour into you? Sneaking up behind somebody trying to find out what they're doing. It's dead. Let it go. It don't matter what they're doing. Stop looking at it. You ain't going to do nothing but get depressed over there trying to find, oh, who they leave me for. For what you care for. She ain't even bad. And? She might not be bad, but maybe she listened. He might not be rich, but at least he prays and he, and he cares. And Even, even, even the reason why you get in relationship, the seasons and the, the choices you make to get in relationships need to change. You used to get in them because you, you need to help paying your bills. That need to change. You used to get them because you didn't want to be lonely. That needs to change. Now you need to find out, God, what does thou have for me? Who's going to help me complete my vision? Who's going to help me? Come on, man. Who, 
Who do you have for me? Not who do I want for myself. I keep picking for me, and then I keep end up. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to stop, and what do you want me to start? Oh, Lord, I wish I had a church in here. Boy, I'm, listen, if y'all could get this, this will set you free because God is calling for the end of a season. And here you are praying for God to keep a season alive that he wants to be done with. You might even be dealing with a season he never started. And you asking him to keep something alive that he didn't authenticate. Lord, help me to save this relationship. God says, I can't help you save it because I didn't help you start it. So what I'm going to do is wipe every tear away. I'm going to rock you in this bed. I'm going to keep you from blowing your brains out. I'm going to make sure that you don't have enough aspirin to kill yourself. But as far as that relationship, I did not authorize it, so I cannot adjust it. You always forfeit a holy warranty when you deal with unauthorized users. Whenever you let somebody unauthorized touch you, you are therefore out of warranty. Lord, help me in this place. God is not obligated to help you and warranty you when you allow somebody to touch you that he did not authorize. My daughter, I remember my daughter, Tanisha, I bought her an iPhone some time ago, and she took it to the AT&T store, and, and, and the screen had broke, and she took it to one of them people and got it changed to a yellow screen. And one day, she wanted to upgrade on the phone. I took it back to the store and tried to upgrade it. They wouldn't upgrade it. I said, why not? She, they said, well, we can tell that this phone has been tampered with. We can tell that somebody replaced this screen because we don't replace our phones with yellow screens. So she took the value of a phone and depleted it all the way to zero because she went for fashion over authorized. And she allowed somebody to fix the phone that was not authorized to fix it, and we had to buy her a new phone from scratch. Why? Because she let somebody touch it who was not authorized. And whenever you let somebody fix on you that hasn't been authorized, whenever you let somebody pray over you that ain't prayed in the Word, whenever you allow somebody to speak in your life that doesn't even speak to God, you decrease the value of your anointing. Lord, I got to, let me stop. So I can talk about this all day long. I can talk about this all day long. You're allowing people to speak into your life. Yeah, they are crafty with the word, but are they authorized? And there was but one authorized dealer in the Lighthouse Church, and his name is Keon Henderson. Everybody else who speaks into your life is an unauthorized dealer. That's why your destiny is so low. Oh, they're crafty and they're smart, but they're not authorized. No more than if I come to your house when I step into your house, you are the authorized dealer. You got to know when seasons are over. You got to know when they're over, and you got to embrace it. And when they're over, you just be like, you know what? It's over. When God says it's enough for that job, I know it might pay well, but you be holding on to a job and God trying to give you a business. When it's over, it's over. You have to embrace it. It's one of the things that comes with getting, with getting older. See, there are some of us right now, you in that 30 and 40 range, you still think you're 20, but baby, that season is over. Come on now, talk to me. When you get 30 and 40 years old, you get sleepy at a different time. It'd be time to go to bed. I remember when I was 20 years old, I could stay out all day long and never go to bed. Now, about 9, 30, 10, I'm like, oh, swing low, sweet cherry on. I'd be ready to go to bed. I, I'm starting to take naps now. I used to never take naps. I understand that standing up for 9, 12, 15, 16 hours straight, slap your nerves, that season is over. I need a nap. I used to go all day long and didn't eat nothing. Just get up and run all day and work. Boy, by 9 o'clock now, I've been having hunger pains. That season... Taking vitamins now and vitamin C and when I sneeze, I sneeze twice now. I used to sneeze once, now they come in twos. I can't even sneeze once no more. Can you believe that? The season has shifted. 
I used to spend money on cars and, and, and expensive cars and all that kind of stuff because I was in a season where I needed it. Now I need to see my money, not spend my money. I used to be in a season where I, when I drove a car and somebody complimented it, it did something for me. Now I don't care what you think about what I drive. I don't care what you think about what I drive. Follow me to the bank and you will see why I don't drive it. I don't care what you think about it. Why? Because the season has shifted. I can't put my child through college with a car. If my wife gets sick, I can't take them a Lamborghini and say, you know, heal her. Or, or if I get sick, I can't take them a Ferragamo outfit and say, do something with it. It doesn't, 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 doesn't do anything. Season got a shift. You need to stop buying purses and get some real estate. You're around here with Fendi bags and red bottoms and written. And your season is shifting, baby. I don't care if you get mad at me. Daddy just told you, your spiritual father told you, the season is shifting. Yeah, you bad and bougie, but baby, now it's time for you to get some property so you can have something to leave your child so that when you die, they don't have to go to the church and take up an offering to bury you. The season is shifting. You know what? I ain't going to preach no more of that sermon. I am here to tell y'all that the season is shifting. Your mentality has to change. There is a new day and a new season, and it is time for you to let one season die and another season to live. If Jesus could do it, the season is shifting. You need to be in a saving season now, not a spending season. <laughs> you better start saving. I don't care if you save but $10 a week. People be thinking that since you can't save $1,000 a day, it don't matter. Baby, let me tell you, you save $10 every day for long enough. You save $10 a day for long enough, and you'll look up. Did you not know that 66% of millennials aged born between 1980 and 1999, 99 I should say, and 80, did you know that 66% of us have no retirement? And I'm talking to, I, I, I can tell you right now, I'm looking at some of y'all right now. You are 34, 32, 35, no retirement. Zero. You either are going to work till you 90 or marry good. One of the two. And the way the world working, it looks like you're going to be working to 90. How are you going to retire if you don't start saving till you 40? Sixty-six percent of us have no retirement, opted to not own our own properties and to pay down student loans. Oh, I wish I could help you. I wish I, I, wish I could just right now and just, and just stop this whole sermon and help you and let you know how backwards it is for you to be so consumed with trying to pay off these student loans and throwing all this money at a student loan when at the end of the day, you need to be saving some of your assets for yourself. The student loan people, they're going to be fine. Just pay the minimum until you can give them a little extra. But don't be giving nobody all your money. They call you on the phone talking about, uh, can we arrange a payment plan? Yeah, I'll arrange to call you back next month. That's what we're going to arrange. I'm not saying don't pay your debt, but I'm saying that you are your first priority. You have to understand that a season is changing. You're going to have to think different. You're going to have to change the way you see the world. And you better hurry up because the older you get, the faster these days go by. 
When you're young, time go by slow. When you get older, you be like, did I go to sleep and not have woke up? Am I 30? What, what happened? Am I, am I? It goes so fast. Like, do you know it's April? That we just had a watch night service two days ago? Season is shifting. Number two, everybody say, go global with what you got. You better stop thinking so small. Jesus said to these non-believing jokers, go into the world. He didn't say go around the corner. He didn't say start a mom and pop. He said my first commission for you is to go big or go home. You unbelieving believers, you still go global with what you got. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm really trying to say to you is God is saying go big even though you're not big. Dream big even though you're not polished. Go into all of the world. Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I'd already called you to be global. This ain't resonating with everybody. Because some of us are so small in our thought that even when we do dream, we put God in a small box. One day, I'm just going to start a little business and get a little side hustle and a little income. God said, I didn't tell you to do nothing little. I told you to go into the world. Whatever you do, do it big. If you do it big and you fail, you will fail small. If you start small, you will fail completely. Does that make sense? So if you go big and it don't work, at least you'll have some, you know, you may not reach 10, but you might reach four. But if your goal is four, you're going to hit zero. You have to go big. I don't care what it is God is telling you to do right now. Go all in. Go large. Do not play it safe. You got to go all the way. If you ask, I, I interview people who are my senior all the time. Whenever I interview people who are my senior, they always tell me I would have went much bigger much sooner. He says, because one of the fallacies of youth is fear. We always play it safe. You got to go big. I have never seen anybody ever in life die because they were so passionate about what God had called them to do, that God didn't sustain them with the ability, the life, the fortitude, according to his will, in order to get the job done. You got to go big or go home. You got to go large or don't do it at all. Stop going to school just to get some papers. Go to school and get a degree that's going to help you. If you're not going to get something that's going to help you, don't get in no debt trying to go get nothing just to go to school. I'm in school for what? I'm going back to school for my, for my, for what? Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Always going back to school for what? For more debt? Because if it ain't going to help you make more money, if you don't have a plan for it right away, and if you don't have a job lined up, and if they're not going to help you do it, why are you going back to get for what? People tell me all the time, you need to go back and get your doctor degree. For what? I have, a, I have a theology degree right now. When I go back and get my doctor degree, it will be convenient for me. But why in the world will I go give somebody $100,000 to become a pastor? Uh, newsflash, I'm already one. And I'm not against education, and I'm not saying you shouldn't go get it, but you got to even be smart about how you do that. You already in debt. You already can't pay your student loans. Why are you going back and adding to it? Because commensurate to value, no job that you're going to find when you come out of school is going to pay you enough to bridge the gap between what you owe and what you're taking on. You got to think. Everybody say go big. Or go home. This is what's called the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, preaching to all of them the great commission. When, when you commission something, you, you actually give it um, um, a mandate. So he's giving them a mandate. But how many of y'all know there's another commission? So when you work for commissions, See, whenever you work commissioned, then whatever you make, the person who owns it gives you a portion. All right? So watch this. The Great Commission, go ye therefore into all the world. What he's actually telling them is that globalization is actually your portion. That I guarantee you global because I didn't call you a prophet to the neighborhood. I called you a prophet to the nations. Just touch somebody and say, you're sitting next to somebody who's global. You are, did you know that? That you are global? That you have world dominance in your vision? That not only are you supposed to be working in Houston, but you're also supposed to be doing things in Africa, and you're supposed to be doing things in Uruguay. You're supposed to be doing things all over the world. God says, I don't know what the devil has done with his children, but I know what I have done with mine, and I have given every one of you the propensity to go large, to be global, to be a, 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 a staker in this world, to be a global partner, to do things on a large scale. You don't always have to be praising God for what he's done for somebody else. Somebody need to start praising God for what he's done for you. They need to start reading about what God has done for you. They need to start asking you for your advice. You don't need to always be asking somebody to tell you what to do. You need to put your plan to action so they will ask you. See, this, this, this message ain't for everybody because people are afraid of big stuff. You know why? Because when you do big things, you got to go into the mountains and pray. And you got to go and fast for 40 days. And I knew this sermon was going to be hard because just like the disciples, some of y'all don't believe. And I am up here telling you the same things that Jesus told his disciples to go big or go home. And some of y'all are still sitting there in your fear talking about, but I can't do it. I don't have the education. Nobody knows me. I don't have the hookups. God did not ask you who you knew. He did not ask you what you had. He told you to go. How many of y'all received this word in this place today? And then last, he says, this is why I was saying this is prophetic, Will. Baptizing them in the name of Jesus. You're going to end one season and begin another, and you're going to go global in the name of Jesus. You're not going to do it in your name, and you can have more degrees than a thermometer. That ain't going to help you. You can have a business plan written out, and it ain't going to do nothing but be fire paper. You're going to do this in the name of Jesus. And he goes on to tell them that in the name of Jesus that you can drink poison and not die. That's what he said. You, you can drink the poison of a snake and nothing will happen to you. If you need Bible to prove that, the Bible says that Paul puts his hand in fire and is bitten by a snake and nothing happens in the name of Jesus. See, the name of Jesus breaks yokes. The name of Jesus is a strong tower. The name of Jesus is a name above every other name. See, what you don't understand is you're going in your name. He says your name is only strong when you connect it to a name that's above every other name. And when you go to work tomorrow, don't go in your name. Go in the name of Jesus. So when you go to that work interview, you don't go in thinking that your outfit is going to get you the job. You're in there waiting on them to call your name. And while you're waiting on them to call your name, guess what name you're calling? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Do something with the person who's going to read my report. Do something with somebody who's going to see my resume. Get my name. In the name of Jesus, I command my resume to fall into the right hands. In the name of, oh, I wish I had somebody who will take your situation right now and start applying the name of Jesus to it. can't even be saved without the name of Jesus. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised his son from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. There, there is something about the name of Jesus. And here's, here's the problem. You're not utilizing it correctly. You're not, using, you, you're, you're, you're not utilizing it correctly. You're using it for praise. It's really a name for access. Lord, y'all missing this sermon. Did you know that Mary and Joseph did not name him Jesus? No. God told them, and his name shall be. God named him. 
His father told his mother and stepfather what his name would be because, watch this, the name of Jesus is the only name that has equivalent power in heaven, hell, and earth. If you go to hell, thou art there. If you go to heaven, thou art there. If you are in the earth, thou art there. In other words, the name of Jesus has access on every level. What has been loosed in heaven has already been bound on earth. And what has been bound on earth has already been loosed in heaven. Why? Because of the name of Jesus. You don't use it. You don't, you don't get that name. That name of Jesus destroys yokes. Demons are subject to it. You're dealing with evil people, you don't got to cuss them out. Just say, in the name of Jesus, I bind this spirit. You think it make you holy, but you know what? I told you again, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run in and be saved. If you'll start utilizing that name instead of coming in your own flesh and coming in your own, trying to get even and letting people know that you're not weak and that you're not, that you're not a pushover, you, you're, trying to, you're so busy trying to show how strong you are, and it is only in your weakness that he is made strong. So while you're trying to show us how strong and tough you are and how much you're not going to take, I dare you to come out of your flesh and start applying Jesus to people and watch what they will do when you put the Lord... I dare you right now, instead of arguing with somebody, I dare you to look at an enemy and say, you know what, I bind you in the name of Jesus. And instead of cussing them out, start praying for them. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, would you do something with them that I cannot do? You've got to call on the name of Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. That's why I said it was prophetic, because everything that I'm talking about today, you can do in the name of Jesus. Jesus climbed up a hill called Calvary. He climbs up a hill called Calvary. A man who knew no sin became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. And now the Jesus who climbed up a hill with no sin can now send his grace down a hill and save those of us who are sinful. It is all done in the, here is my favorite term, in the matchless name of Jesus. Have you ever heard that terminology? The matchless name of Jesus. There is no name under heaven and earth by which men shall be saved. It is the only name that makes demons tremble in hell. It is the only name that makes angels bow in the heavens. It is the only name that makes knees bow in the earth. Somebody ought to call on the name of Jesus. I remember a time in church, if you said the name of Jesus, the whole church would go crazy. Right now, for some of us, God means blessings. It means money. You say money, they run around the church. You say blessing, they run around the church. You say miracle, they run around the church. But they don't understand that I don't need a miracle. I don't need a blessing. I don't need a car. I don't need a house. I just need the name of Jesus. And when I walk with the name of Jesus, I walk into the bank with a 500 credit score, and Jesus will make everything all right. When I call on the name of Jesus, I get an application that'll go through that'll normally be denied. Why? Because I came in the name of Jesus. Stop going in the name of your finances. Stop going in the name of your money. He will not bless you according to what you have, but it will be according to his riches and glory. That name that's above every other name. Church, whatever you do, you better do it in the name of Jesus. It's more powerful than politics. It's more powerful than pain. It's more powerful than poverty. There's an old saying that in the war, you never find an atheist in the foxhole. Because every time one of those bullets come off, even an atheist say, help me, Jesus. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee's going to bow. He... God will fix the situation where whether, even if you don't believe, he'll make you call his name. So since you're going to have to call his name, you might as well be a believer and benefit from it. Because the unbeliever is still going to have to say it, but nothing's going to happen when they do. Did y'all hear what I just said? The atheist is still going to have to say his name, but nothing will happen. Believers call his name and demons tremble. You are saved. Jesus, from this point on, he's going back.
He's at the right hand of the Father. The thrill is gone. What are you going to do now? Because if it's going to work, you're going to have to work it. You're going to have to end the season. You're going to have to go global, and you're going to have to do it in the name of Jesus. And right now, the welfare line is closed to you. Stop looking for the manna to come out of heaven because it ain't coming. Don't go to that rock. Won't be no water there. You know that pillar of cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night? You know that little, that little thing that God will give you to show you exactly where he wants you to go? It's gone. You're going to have to seek him. <laughs> You're going to have to seek his face. This is the season that we are in. And this is the lesson you must learn if you will benefit from Pentecost. Because in the last day, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And he's looking for you and I to respond. And the only thing you ought to want him to say to you is, that good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things. And because you went global even though you wasn't good, and because you ended a season and started another one, because of that, and you did it in my name, I'll make you ruler over many things. This is your year to rule. This is your year to rule. This is your year to take over. This is your year to stand fast and stand firm. This is your year to see things you've never seen before. It's your year to walk into the newness of life. It's your year to be happy and not sad. Depressed one week, semi-happy the next week. No, this is the year to have joy, unspeakable joy. This is the year for you to be happy with yourself, no matter what that means. <laughs> this, this is the year for you to know he created you the way you are. And you know the way you were made? It don't matter how much you exercise, you're never going to look like her. The goal ain't to look like her. The goal is to be the best version of you. Come on, sister. Some of y'all wasn't made to be a two. You ain't going to never be a two. You around here starving yourself thinking that, that a two is beautiful. It is for somebody, but somebody like a nine and a ten and a... A 16, come on, y'all, holler back at your boy. As long as you're healthy, as long as you're healthy and as long as you're meeting the requirements of the stage of life you're in, 